Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here. Hope everyone's doing well in these strange times. Um, so my name is Aoife McNichol. I'm a PhD student in DCU and I'm here today to talk about the results of my research, uh, which was looking at the educational and psychosocial effects of assistive technology use uh, in higher education. Um, I suppose before I get going with the presentation itself, I'm just kind of interested to get some perspectives from you guys as well in relation to this. So um, maybe if Christine, if you wouldn't mind launching the poll, um, I just want to kind of get your opinions around um, the reasons for non-use of assistive technology in higher education. So if everyone wouldn't mind just uh, completing that and I'm going to come back then to uh, the results of that later on in the presentation. Um, okay, so first of all, just to give a brief overview of what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm firstly just going to give a brief outline of what assistive technology or AT is. Um, I'm then just going to touch on what we currently know uh, from the research on AT, uh, what's missing or where the gaps are in our knowledge. Um, I'm then going to talk about the study uh, which I conducted and some of the key findings from that particular study. And I'm going to wrap up then um, with just some future directions and areas of interest um, arising from my research. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, what is assistive technology or AT? Um, it can be defined as any product whose primary purpose is to maintain or improve an individual's functioning and independence and thereby promote their well-being. Um, and this is quite broad. It can cover a range of different devices from mobility aids, uh, hearing devices, visual aids, um, educational uh, assistive technologies such as live scribe pens. Um, and more increasingly as well, over recent years, we're seeing um, the use of mainstream devices um, and the accessibility features um, on these particular devices, devices such as um, iPhones um, or iPads as well. Um, so in terms of what we currently know, about the effects of AT use within higher education. Um, as part of my PhD, I conducted a systematic review in this area. And what we found was that, uh, first of all, uh, AT use supports students' ability to perform academic tasks. And um, so that's anything from reading, uh, writing, note-taking, uh, test-taking or studying. Um, it has also been found to support students' engagement with educational material and also promote academic performance as well. Um, but outside of the educational benefits, uh, there has also been psychological and social benefits of AT use noted. Um, so in relation to that, uh, we found that AT use uh, increased students' self-confidence in relation to their abilities uh, to contribute to class uh, discussions. Um, it also promoted a greater sense of autonomy in that students were able to independently engage with tasks without needing support from others. Um, and we also found it promoted better interactions both inside and outside the classroom with both peers and lecturers. Um, but despite what is currently known, there still uh, remains a number of different gaps in the research or in the knowledge, um, one of which being that predominantly um, the research to date has looked at the impact of AT on the performance of academic tasks without kind of considering um, education engagement more holistically. Um, so in terms of that, um, I'm referring to looking at maybe how AT uh, impacts or affects students' abilities to engage in extracurricular activities. Um, and also um, on their emotional engagement as well within higher education. Um, in addition, um, no study to date has looked at uh, the relationship between AT and quality of life and academic self-efficacy within higher education. Um, while this has been looked at within, say, a secondary school environment, um, there's many differences uh, in the organisations and structures between um, secondary school and higher education. Um, so the findings may not necessarily be transferable uh, to higher education. So just kind of to give you a, a quick overview of some of the differences. Um, within higher education, um, it may be the first time that 
that students are living independently uh, away from home. Um, often it's the first time that students have to self-advocate uh, for supports um, and also it may be the first time in which they have to manage and organise their own personal assistance. So uh, we thought it would be useful to kind of look at these relationships within this particular uh, context in light of this. Um, and lastly, uh, many of the other studies which have been conducted to date have looked at uh, the effects of AT among students with a particular disability diagnosis. So for example, among students with learning disabilities or uh, visual impairments. Um, and we felt there was a need there to kind of look more broadly both across different types of AT, but also um, across students with various different disability diagnoses as well. So in relation um, to the study, uh, we conducted it addressed to um, it aimed to address the the kind of gaps I, I talked about in the previous slide. Um, and we aim to first of all, I suppose, identify um, the AT profiles of both uh, users and non-users, um, to explore the patterns of relationships between AT needs. So this distinguishes between um, students who indicate that their AT needs are fully met. Uh, versus students who uh, indicate they have unmet AT needs and looking at the relationship between AT needs and educational engagement um, and psychosocial outcomes and um, to explore the impact of AT use on quality of life and then finally to examine if AT needs so again met versus unmet is a predictor of students educational engagement. So in terms of what um, the study actually looked like, uh, it was a cross-sectional survey which was completed online and could be completed on any um, laptop or smart device. Um, and any student uh, with any type of disability who was currently uh, studying in higher education in Ireland and who's currently using or could potentially benefit from any type of AT was eligible uh, to participate. And um, so I'm just going to kind of give a brief overview of the different measures which I used in the study. And um, so I used two different measures of education engagement and um, the college learning effectiveness inventory and the student course engagement questionnaire. Um, and just some of the things uh, that the college learning effectiveness inventory assessed uh, was things like uh, academic self-efficacy, um, class communication, um, uh, involvement in extracurricular activities, uh, emotional um, satisfaction, um, organisation and attention to study, and stress and time press. And in relation to student course engagement questionnaire, uh, this looked at things like performance engagement, which was like academic performance, uh, skills engagement, participation, interaction engagement and emotional engagement. Um, in terms of the psychosocial measures that were used, I used the self-efficacy for learning form of bridge. Uh, so this assessed students uh, perceived um, ability to complete uh, academic tasks such as note-taking, test-taking and studying. Uh, the Warwick Edinburgh mental wellbeing scale was a measure of wellbeing um, which looked at positive effect and satisfaction with interpersonal relationships. And then finally, the psychosocial impact of assistive devices scale uh, was used to assess the impact of AT use um, on quality of life. And it looked at different aspects such as competence, adaptability and self-esteem. So I'm firstly just going to go through um, the sample characteristics uh, in relation to who actually completed the study itself. Um, so we had 111 um, students uh, complete the survey, uh, 32 of which were male, 77 female and two which identified as other. Um, and as you can see from the graph, um, there is quite a wide range of different disabilities uh, represented within that group. Um, so we had 35% who um, identified as having more than one disability, 19% um, uh, disabilities identified as other. Uh, so that included ADD, ADHD, um, a significant ongoing illness or autism spectrum disorders. Uh, we had 7% uh, 
identify with a psychological impairment, 19% of specific learning difficulty, and 10% of physical impairment, and 10% of sensory impairment. Um, in terms of uh, the year of study which students were enrolled in, again, there was quite a good mix. Um, but the majority of students were in their uh, first year of study, that was 42 uh, participants. Um, and again, in terms of enrollment in the type of programme, um, again, it was quite diverse, but most students were in um, an honours bachelor degree, and that was 68 uh, participants. But we also had students enrolled in postgrad taught programmes and research degrees and in advanced certificates as well. And um, so just to kind of give you a breakdown of uh, the group by 80 status and needs. Um, so 82 of uh, the students who completed the survey were currently used in 80 and 29 um, were not currently used in 80. And of the students as well, we had 64 who indicated that their AT needs were fully met um, and 44 who indicated that they, they still had unmet AT needs. And of that 44, we had 17 um, who were current AT users but had additional needs and 27 who were not currently using AT but who indicated that they uh, required it. Um, so I'm just going to give a breakdown now um, of the current AT users. Um, so we asked them about frequency of use and um, the majority, 54 um, of the current users were using their AT every day. Um, we had 15 who were using it once or twice a week and seven who were using it every couple of weeks. Um, in relation to satisfaction levels, 93% of students indicated that they were satisfied with their AT. Uh, we had 5% who said they were neither satisfied nor dissatisfied and 2% indicated that they were dissatisfied. Um, in terms of the different types of AT that students were using, uh, again, a quite diverse mix. So we had 61% um, using some type of educational assistive technology, 22% um, indicated that they were using more than one type of AT. 10% um, using AT identified as other, so that kind of referred to adaptive furniture um, such as height adjustable desks. Um, we had 1% using mobility aids, 1% uh, using visual aids, and 5% uh, using aids to hearing. So, um, Christine, I might just get you to um, launch the results of the poll if you wouldn't mind. Just no problem. Do you want me to share the results? Yeah, uh, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. Can oh, you see that there? I can indeed. Um, okay, so I kind of just wanted to get your feedback because this is actually a question um, in which I asked uh, the students themselves um, in relation to what was their main reason for not using AT. Um, so I can see there 41% uh, of you thought uh, that they were simply just unaware of the availability of AT. Then we had 25% um, insufficient time to learn to use, 19% um, stigma and embarrassment, 11% um, can't access, and then 4% device unsuitable. So um, I'm actually kind of, I suppose, maybe a little bit surprised in some respects about that. Um, so what I actually found, um, the main reason among uh, the students uh, who completed my survey um, they indicated that stigma and embarrassment was the main reason for non-use and I suppose um, considering this, um, in the research we know that assistive technology can often draw kind of extra attention um, to students with disabilities um, and in the cases of maybe students who have invisible disabilities, uh, this may be a particular uh, issue in relation to, to use around assistive technology. So, um, I, I suppose that is why, why um, a lot of the students may have indicated that. But um, apart from that, we had uh, in my survey itself, we had uh, students indicating then after that that they just simply couldn't access uh, the AT. Um, then the device being unsuitable or inappropriate. Um, students maybe not just simply not needing um, the AT. And then I suppose the, the lowest reason given her was um, awareness and not being aware of AT. Um, so 
And that was interesting just to see kind of your guys' uh, perspective on that. Um, because from this, I suppose the students that took part in my survey, I don't, awareness didn't seem to be a, a particularly big issue in relation to non-use. Um, okay, so just looking at the results then um, in relation to the relationship between AT needs and education engagement, um, what we found was that those who reported their AT needs were fully met uh, scored significantly higher on four of the 10 education engagement subscales um, compared to those with unmet AT needs. Um, so in relation to academic self-efficacy, um, those whose needs were fully met um, felt that they uh, were more confident in their abilities to be successful within higher education compared to those with unmet AT needs. Uh, in relation to stress and time press, uh, those with met AT needs felt that they were better able to uh, manage stress and the demands of their college workload uh, compared to those with unmet AT needs. Uh, in relation to class communication, um, those with met AT needs uh, felt they were better able to contribute to class discussions uh, with both peers and lectures uh, in comparison to those with unmet AT needs. And um, in relation to performance engagement, those with met AT needs uh, felt that they were able to perform better academically um, than those with unmet AT needs. Um, so we then looked to see whether or not uh, the AT needs variable, so again, whether students' needs are met versus unmet was a predictor of education engagement. Um, and we used the hierarchical multiple regression to look at this. Um, but what we found was that after controlling um, for a number of variables, um, gender, academic self-efficacy and well-being, uh, we found that AT needs did not significantly predict uh, stress and time press scores, class communication scores or performance engagement scores. Um, so you may be wondering why that was the case um, based on the results I just went through in the previous slide. Um, so there's a number of different factors that might have been at play uh, which could explain this. Um, the first being that because there was such a diversity in the types of AT students we're using, um, that some may not have been particularly uh, relevant to students' uh, education engagement. Um, also, we entered the AT needs variable as the last block in the model to look at unique uh, variants. So any shared variance between say the AT needs variable and some of the other uh, predictors wouldn't have been accounted for. Um, and then finally as well, generally um, people who come forward and participate in research tend to be highly engaged. So it may have been a case that across the board um, that the students uh, tended to be uh, quite engaged and there wasn't maybe much variation in terms of their education and engagement. So that could have been kind of another uh, factor at play there. Um, so just looking then at the results of AT um, on psychosocial outcomes, uh, we found that those who AT needs were fully met uh, scored significantly higher on both academic self-efficacy, so that was in relation um, to their perceived ability to complete, say, note-taking, test-taking and studying, um, but also um, that they scored significantly higher on well-being as well. Uh, compared to those with unmet AT needs. Um, looking at the, the effects of AT use on quality of life, um, we found that students uh, reported the greatest positive uh, impacts of AT use in the area of competence, uh, followed by adaptability and self-esteem. Um, we also found that demographic variables such as age, uh, gender, or a uh, category of disability did not have a significant influence on uh, these quality of life scores. Um, we did, however, find that frequent AT users um, scored higher on uh, competence than non-frequent AT users. Um, but I suppose it's just important to kind of be mindful um, in considering that particular finding that uh, frequency of AT use doesn't always uh, necessarily equate to importance um, and there may be some students who are using their devices occasionally um, but could be using them for very uh, important tasks. 
Um, so just kind of some, I suppose, key take home messages um, from uh, my study. Uh, the first being that uh, the benefits of AT um, extend beyond the performance of academic tasks when we're kind of thinking about the educational benefits. So um, we found that when students' AT needs were met, it also had a positive uh, impact on their ability to kind of deal with stress and manage workloads and their ability to um, contribute to class discussions and also on academic performance as well. Um, in relation to psychological benefits, um, for the findings that uh, AT um, was important in terms of students' quality of life and their academic self-efficacy um, and also their well-being as well. And then uh, finally as well, um, because we included such a diverse um, range of AT um, and also because the students who took part in the study as well ha had a wide range of disabil different disabilities, um, it's important to um, consider this as well and that AT can be useful and beneficial um, for a wide variety of students and not just um, students with a particular uh, type of disability. Um, so I suppose kind of some future directions of areas kind of interest arising uh, from the research. Um, I think firstly it would be very beneficial um, to develop validated AT specific outcome measures for educational engagement. Um, the ones I used in this particular study um, had been used previously within higher education and among students with disabilities, um, but they weren't AT specific like the psychosocial impact of assistive devices skills. So I think it would be really useful um, to develop measures like this to enable kind of more consistency, I suppose, in terms of looking at uh, AT impacts in cross-sectional uh, studies. Um, it would also be useful to kind of look in more detail at the AT related factors which are most important in promoting um, psychological and social well-being. Um, and then finally, um, because um, students kind of indicated that their number one reason for non-use of AT was stigma or embarrassment, um, I think it'd be really interesting to look at this in more detail um, and how this interacts with students' self-identity and maybe any kind of issues that are arising uh, from that and potential consequences that can have uh, for students as well. And I'm actually um, looking at that particular issue at the minute as part of the last phase of my uh, PhD when conducting student or interviews with students um, around uh, that whole issue of um, the role of assistive technology and self-identity. So hopefully I'll have some um, results to share with everyone on that in uh, a few uh, weeks or months time. Um, so that's kind of, uh, I suppose, the end of my presentation. I'd just like to thank everyone for listening and if anyone is interested in following uh, the progress of my research um, I have a Facebook and Twitter page um, set up under um, Enable Study so people can um, follow me there if they're interested. Great, Aoife, God, thank you so much. Um, as someone like myself who's interested in AT, fantastic to see such an in-depth um, study done and so much kind of student engagement as well throughout, because I think the information you got is incredibly rich. Was there anything mm -hmm. in particular that kind of shone through that might have surprised or, or verified something you suspected about AT? Um, well, yeah, I think just the, the main thing um, that came across there, uh, especially in relation to non-use, was just how much of an impact stigma and embarrassment is having um, on students. And I think even just from the poll, um, maybe we didn't or wouldn't necessarily think that to be um, one of the main barriers uh, to stay use. Um, so I think that's definitely something that needs to be considered and looked at in, in greater depth and kind of how we can combat that because um, if students are, are needing AT um, and aren't using it, it can have kind of, I suppose, significant negative impacts in terms of their academic progression as well. Because so. mm. even like um, those visible ATs, you know, like the live scrap yeah. pens and visualizers, you know, they can flag a, mm -hmm. a disability that might be considered like an invisible. Yeah. So in those kind of circumstances, I suppose I'd be interested in how a student kind of balances, 
you know, yeah. that kind of issue of like, you know, I might have a problem and I need a LifeScribe pen and mm-hmm, I can greatly yeah. benefit from using it, but then all my peers and my lecturers see me using this tool and then, yeah. you know, suddenly, you know, without saying a word, you're disclosing a lot of personal information to everyone around mm-hmm. you. So, so in terms of the stigma, did you find students themselves had solutions about stigma and destigmatizing? Um, well, that's like what I'm looking at kind of as part of, I suppose, uh, the last phase of my PhD. So I'm actually looking at that at the minute. So I've completed some interviews with students um, and I'm hoping to do kind of follow up in the next while. Uh, but I think for a lot of the students, it kind of comes down to uh, necessity and I suppose balancing um, the challenges with the benefits. Um, and kind of, I, I think for a lot of the students, the benefits outweighed the challenges. So mm. even though it did maybe attract that little bit more of attention, and they kind of got to the stage where um, maybe initially it was kind of uh, an issue for them, but once kind of everyone became accustomed to it, um, and they themselves, I suppose, became accustomed to using it out uh, within like the, the university environment that it became easier, I suppose, for them to manage as well. Um, wow. But I, one thing that was coming up um, from some of the students is that they, there are some students that were using multiple different types of AT devices. And it kind of came down to making a decision about um, which devices are most important for me to use. And um, I suppose some did attract extra attention to them, but mm. then there was other cases where they opted maybe for a more mainstream device. Okay. Instead of using maybe one that was uh, prescribed, say, by the disability or assistive technology services. Um, so that was kind of another, I suppose, method that some students use in terms of managing um, maybe a bit of okay. extra attention or increased visibility yeah. as well. Well, Aoife, loads of questions have come in. So I might bring uh, Christine in at this stage because I'm yeah. sure she's been looking at the Q&A. <laughs> yeah, There's it's been blowing up here for you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I think you kind of addressed one or two there in your discussion. Um, if I were to just maybe ask uh, another one or two there to you, Aoife, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so Hilary Mursa has asked, how do you engage with uh, students with learning disabilities who have admitted to having a previous negative experience with AT? Um, it's kind of a tough question. Um, I suppose it's providing them with the, the appropriate supports, um, not only, I say, from, say, the Disability Services or AT office, um, but I think it's also about educating um, more widely as well within um, the university. So I, in terms of, um, I suppose, AT becoming more accepted um, within higher education, I think it comes more to an education point of view as well. Um, like I think staff, uh, higher education staff generally um, would need kind of training in um, like UDL principles um, in how to, I suppose, deal with students who maybe are using assistive technology and how to deal with that in um, with discretion as well and not kind of draw extra attention to them. Um, but one of the, the one of the things that did come up as well uh, through my research was uh, one of the students I interviewed actually suggested um, colleges and universities uh, maybe trying to uh, implement some sort of AT community of practice where they might hold kind of regular meetings with students um, and kind of invite them along, just kind of an informal thing like a coffee morning or something like that, where yeah. the difference, you're using different types of AT, you can get together and kind of talk about their experiences, maybe any positive, any negative experiences, and kind of just share uh, with one another. And I think that would be hugely beneficial as well in terms of, um, I suppose, helping students deal with any kind of negative experiences that they have uh, come across. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And I suppose as different people would address the technology differently, they can, you know, support each other. That peer support can be really great as well. Um, yeah. David Allen also has a question here. Um, so I'm going to try and get through as many as I can. So apologies mm-hmm. if I don't get to everybody. You're just so popular, Aoife. Uh, <laughs> you've just sparked a, a massive conversation with people. You, you can read through the comments uh, afterwards. Um, but just so you know, so uh, David Allen has just said, 
was there any difference in the uptake of assistive technology um, for people that were in different, now I, I, let me know, David, if, I, if, I, if I'm giving this question right, but um, was there any difference in the uptake of assistive technology um, in between kind of different socioeconomic backgrounds? So maybe if someone was maybe from a lower socioeconomic background, were they kind of more or less likely to take up the assistive technology or... Um, that was actually something we didn't look at, like we didn't actually um, ask that particular question in relation to socioeconomic status within the questionnaire itself, but um, that would definitely be something interesting um, to look at, um, but we didn't actually look at that at all within the survey. Oh, that's grand. That's no problem at all. Um, well, do we have time for another question, Trevor, or how are we doing? Yeah, um, I, I think so. Well, one of the things um, that I think is sometimes just that term AT can mm -hmm. just say if lecturers are aware of it, because sometimes it's called inclusive technology or educational technology as well as assistive technology. And then if lecturers are aware of it, um, do they feel comfortable approaching a student then about the assistive technologies a student uses? And then if um, lecturers aren't comfortable, would they like to see staff training around not only disabilities, but assistive technologies as well, just to increase their own awareness about the challenges students with disabilities have and the types of technology strategies they use to, to, to address those kind of learning issues? So I suppose it's more of an open-ended question um, that may not we we may not have the answer here but like you know that's at kind of question is just so wide and growing uh yeah i think definitely um education uh, would help like in terms of training um not only about at but about kind of disability in general um because i think um uh, some of the time some of the time anyways um staff maybe are not comfortable um or don't really know how to i don't know approach the issue um, or deal with the issue with students. So um, I think that is, would definitely uh, be beneficial, but um, also in terms of, I suppose, promoting just a more generally inclusive environment within higher education um, and promoting kind of UDL as well across the board. 